All right, primarily today we're going to talk about fingerprinting and removing late test, uh, latent fingerprints. A latent fingerprint is a fingerprint that's been left behind, it's not necessarily visible on an item. Um, and we have some samples here of a glass, um, a window seal. We're going to talk about different types of methods uh, we have for collecting fingerprints and uh, certain materials we have and certain methods work better in, in some situations. I need to understand first that a fingerprint is of course unique. Everybody's fingerprints are different. Uh, but the fingerprint is created by the lines and ridges on your finger and the secretions of the body. The body secretes moisture, amino acids, as well as oils. And whenever a person handles something or touches something, those uh, fluids are deposited by the fingers. Um, some people will leave a lot of fingerprints. Some people are naturally perspiring or secrete a lot of oils and they leave um, a more defined and more frequent fingerprints than other people. People that have dry skin or are very dry um, in nature is, don't secrete as many fluids, they leave very light or very poor fingerprints. Um, in considering the value of the fingerprint as it relates to the crime, uh, the fingerprint has to have a direct relationship to the crime. All the fingerprint does is put somebody at the scene. And in many cases we find out that crimes are committed by someone who's known to the victim or who has been at the scene legitimately in past encounters. Therefore discovering the fingerprints at the scene is not an earth shattering breakthrough in the investigation. Uh, an example that I use frequently when I talk about fingerprints is if, if you have a husband who murders his wife in their bedroom it's reasonable that his fingerprints will be all over the bedroom. He lives there, he touches things in the bedroom on a regular basis, so his fingerprints in the bedroom uh, would not be unusual. However, his fingerprints on a specific murder weapon is going to be a little bit more uh, evidence of the crime. But again, it's not conclusive. If there's a hammer involved or a gun involved and he's had an opportunity in the past to handle the, the, the hammer or the gun, his fingerprints are going to be legitimately on the item and it's not going to necessarily link him to the crime. Another problem with fingerprints is public places. When we have crimes committed in public places such as stores or banks, we go in and we can dust for fingerprints, but anybody who has legitimately been in the business is going to likely leave fingerprints behind. So the mere fact that we found somebody's fingerprints on the counter, it's going to be difficult to say that that's the person who committed the robbery because they could have a very plausible explanation that Yes, I was in there and got a cup of coffee, or I went into the bank and, and did a deposit earlier in the day. So we have, to, we have to be able to relate the fingerprint directly to the crime. If we have a, a burglary scene and we find fingerprints from somebody who has no legitimate reason to be inside the house, that's going to be a good link to a crime. Uh, if we have fingerprints on a specific item that may have been moved or handled during the crime, that's going to also be a better link to the crime provided that the um, suspect can't give us a legitimate reason for having fingerprints on the item. Uh, I have a glass here that we're going to talk about later. Um, as we conduct an investigation, we may come into a house for a burglary investigation and we ask the homeowner, what's out of place? And they may point to a glass and say, I just did all my dishes and put them away. Whoever was in here got themselves a drink a drink of water or something. So we would, that would be an indication that that glass is directly related to the crime scene. Therefore, any fingerprints we detect on it could help us lead to a suspect. When considering the viability of fingerprints and the likelihood of obtaining them, I know we watch TV, we watch crime shows all the time, and uh, they always find the bad guy's prints at the crime scene. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong when it comes to obtaining a fingerprint and identifying it to a suspect. First and foremost, it starts with the suspect's ability to leave a fingerprint. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, people with dry skin don't leave a lot of impression because they don't deposit a lot of moisture or a lot of oil behind. Um, fortunately, most people that are in the process of committing a crime have a tendency to be perspiring or have a tendency to secrete more oils because of their uh, natural reaction to the body to being in an excitable situation. So it's a little more likely when somebody's committing a crime that you will find prints. But the first issue is are they even capable of leaving a print? And then the second big issue comes to us, can we relate that print to the crime scene? Is it a print that does not belong in the house? 
Is there is there print from somebody who doesn't have permission or legitimate reason to be in the house or the location? Then the matter is us being able to find it, to develop it, and recover it in such a way that it could possibly be identified to a specific person or to a print that's already in the database. And that database is called APHIS. It stands for Automated Fingerprint Identification System. Anybody who gets arrested for a crime has to be fingerprinted. Those fingerprints are then submitted to APHIS and they will stay in that database forever or until that person might obtain some type of an expungement of their criminal history record. Um, another database that's commonly referred to is called CODIS and that's the database for the DNA. Uh, CODIS will never be as big as APHIS because not every person arrested is required to submit a DNA sample. Only your most violent offenders or sexual offenders. So the CODIS data space will never be to the size of APHIS. So fingerprints still play a big role in being able to identify suspects of crimes. We have several methods and techniques that I'm going to try and demonstrate for you today to obtain fingerprints. Um, the technique that you're going to use is going to be based upon largely what you're looking for and the type of surface you plan to fingerprint. Essentially we use um, powder is probably the most common. Fingerprint powder is designed to stick to moisture so we're looking at uh, fairly recent fingerprints that might have left behind perspiration. Uh, we use chemicals uh, for oils and as well as um, iodine fuming depending on what type of surface you're going to look at. When we come to fingerprint powder our most common powders are light powders and dark powders. We have black fingerprint powder and we have white fingerprint powder and every color in between of the rainbow from silver to maroon to we now have fluorescent colors um, the colors don't mean a whole lot depending on the, the colors mostly related to the surface the idea behind some of the fluorescent colors and some of the brighter colors is that they may be easier to photograph and we're going to talk about photographing a fingerprint as I, as I start to work here but in most cases when you do locate a latent fingerprint you're going to want to attempt to photograph it before we lift it because by photographing it we can help preserve it anytime we try and lift the fingerprint um, there's, an, there's a, a large capability of destroying or damaging the quality of that print so if we can take the photograph before we lift it we can sometimes preserve that uh, quality in the event that our lift doesn't work as well as we want uh, fingerprint powders are very dirty I'm gonna put on some gloves and I'm gonna put on my jacket they're dust we sometimes refer to them as fingerprint dust or powder um, they will be airborne they're not hazardous but they will be dirty and um, it's hard to get clean off because fingerprint powder is designed to stick to moisture so when you try and wash it a lot of times it just smears like mud so they don't wash up very easily because they do they are designed to stick to moisture therefore when you put water to it it becomes just a muddy uh, reservoir the best product that we've been able to find for cleaning fingerprint uh, powder is some type of foaming bathroom cleaner <coughs> a foaming cleaner will bubble up and it will help you wipe it up if you spray Windex or like 409 or something on it, it just smears, smears like um, mud, mud. So we're going to go back to the powders. We're talking basically about black and white. Again, there is there is multiple colors of fingerprints. Basically, the the first decision making process in terms of the powder I'm going to use is how is it going to contrast with the surface that I'm going to fingerprint. If I'm going to fingerprint a, a dark surface. I generally want to use a light colored powder. And if I'm going to do a light colored surface. I want to use a, uh, a dark colored powder such as the black. Um, many um, fingerprint experts that are much better than me will profess the only black powder. I, I once had a, a very renowned fingerprint expert talk about using black powder and he suggested even fingerprinting dusting black surfaces with black powder and then just randomly trying to make lifts in areas where you thought you might find a fingerprint because he was convinced that black powder was about the best product that was out there. Now, to complicate the powder issue a little bit more, 
is there are there are smooth powders that we call a slip powder because it would be very slippy and there are more of a talcum uh, powdery we call a stick powder because it has a tendency to stick to the surface. The slick powder is going to be more granular. If you look at it very close, it's going to be very granular. It'll roll off and clean off easier. But a stick powder is like just going to stick to everything. So where that now plays into effect is looking at our type of surface. If we're looking at a surface such as glass, glass is a very, very smooth surface. So if, we're, if we use a slip powder, a slippy powder on a slippy surface, you're not going to get as much powder left behind. You're not going to get it to adhere sometimes the way you want. So in looking at a very, very smooth surface such as glass, we're going to probably want to look closer at a, what we would call a stick powder. White powder is traditionally a stick powder, sticky powder, as opposed to black powder has a tendency to be more of a, a slippy powder. Now if you get to a surface such as this countertop, even though it may appear smooth, this would be considered a stick surface because it's going to create a little more friction than the smooth glass surface is going to create. But we're going to use both kinds of powder on here. I'm going to give you an example how, how we use it. Once, once we dust with the powder, we're going to use a brush. And we have our brushes marked for the powder. We don't want somebody to use the black brush with the white powder. We want to inter, intermix the powders. Um, a powder that I've had a lot of success with is what's called a silver black or silver gray. And the reason I've had a lot of success with this is because it's sort of a multi-purpose powder. It has a combination of black and white powder. So on the surfaces you're using, you know, you'll, you'll adhere pretty much anything with the silver black. Also the same thing applies with color-wise. It may appear black, but the silverness in it will come out if you're on a darker surface. So I've had a lot of success with silver black powder. Um, we're going to try some of that today. I'm going to start with this window, and I'm going to do part of this window with the black and part of this window with the white. And you'll see the difference in the type of powder. Basically, we're going to take a piece of paper. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of powder on there. If I need to add more, I can add more, but I don't want to put used powder back into my container because I don't want to introduce moisture or contaminants back into my, my powder container. I'm going to take the brush for white powder, basically I'm going to mix it around, get the brush to try and collect some of this white powder. I'm going to make sure I get rid of the excess. If I don't get rid of the excess, it'll just smear it. Now basically you're going to go to your glass and you're just going to act like you're painting. And it's going to be difficult to probably pick up on a camera. As you can see with the white powder several various latent fingerprints became visible. Sometimes when you're working on glass, it's a transparent surface. If you can get something behind it, especially when you're in a photograph, preferably a, if you're using white powder, you'd like to get something darker back there. <clears throat> I had mentioned earlier about some people leaving better prints to people than others. I have very dry skin. These prints up here, I put on here before we started. Now Justin helped us out by putting the prints on the lower portion. As you can see, my fingerprints are much lighter than, than Justin's. So, 